give us this day. I'm going to talk about prayer because prayer, asking God to do things for us, is the first way we show that we have hope, trust in God for our future. These four weeks before Christmas, the season of Advent is all about hope. It's the time for celebrating our confidence that God will come to us to heal us and to help us. Our confidence that God is coming to heal the whole world and bring it to the kingdom of God. But today, I don't want to talk about God's plan for the whole of human history, but just about his plan for me and for each of you. And so I'm going to talk about personal praying, which is, first of all, asking God that his plan should go one way for you and not another. It's asking of God that his plan should include you or your friend recovering from sickness or passing an exam or being able to keep up with the mortgage payments. There are some puzzling things about prayer. That's why I want to talk about it. First of all, surely God knows better than we do what is good for us. He's wise enough and loving enough to take charge of our lives without our offering advice or clamoring for what we want. Jesus said, your father knows what you need before you ask him. So what's the point of trying to teach him? Well, your father does know what you need before you ask him, but do you? Moreover, remember, it's also Jesus who has the nerve to compare his father answering our prayer to a man who shouted at and pestered by a neighbor in the middle of the night until he reluctantly gets up out of bed and gives him what he wants. But it does seem odd that God should need to be goaded by our nagging before he's ready to give us his gifts. Well, try turning that on its head. Maybe we need to express and recognize our desires by pleading with God before we are ready to accept his gift. I mean, accept it as his gift, as a sign of his love. The prayer is not to make God ready to give, but to make us ready to receive. Have you ever said, ever said thank you for a gift by saying, it's just what I've always wanted? Well, God wants his gifts to be and to be seen to be what we have wanted. After all, every good thing that comes to us is the gift of God. But when it comes as an answer to prayer, we see it for what it really is, as gift of God, as expression of his personal love for us. See, every healing brought about by the skill of doctors and nurses and by the wonders of medical treatment is brought about by God, who holds all of them in being. He holds in being the skill of the doctors and nurses and the power of the healing drugs. The hand of God is in the hands of the surgeon and the nurse. It's in everything that's good and positive that is done. But God is so present in everything in our world that we can forget him. We can think just of the natural causes of things, forgetting that they are all instruments of God's love, that their acts are all divine acts. In Galilee, in the power of God, Jesus multiplied the loaves. But the power of God was just as much in the growing of the barley and the baking of the bread. Only we might not notice it there. It's when good things come to us in answer to prayer that we take notice of the hand of God. And we respond to his love with our love and gratitude. And that is good for us. And that's why God wants us to pray. In prayer, then, we don't want to change God's mind to bring him round to our way of thinking and wanting. Rather, it's God who wants us to change our minds.
to attend to what he gives us, to recognize him, to believe in him and love him and be grateful to him as our loving father. Remember that prayer itself is also one of the good things that God brings into being and holds in being. Our prayer itself, our praying, is as much God's gift as is the answer to it. And prayer is not just God's gift in the way that our power of speech or our health is God's gift. Prayer is God's grace. And that means that it's due to God's own life within us, God's own spirit within us. For God gives us not just our marvelous human powers and skills, he gives us himself, makes us able to live by his own divine life through his son, Jesus Christ. When we pray, we display a divine power which is in us because we are in Christ, sharing his life. We speak to the Father with the voice of the Son, because we've been taken up to share in their spirit. The great prayer, the first prayer, was the cross. When Jesus, for the sake of his fellow men and women, accepted total failure and death, and left it all, to the will of his father. This was the prayer that was answered in the resurrection of Jesus and the redemption of the world. Whenever we pray, it's because in Christ we are linked with that prayer. Whenever we pray, we pray, we share in that prayer, the prayer of the cross. Especially, of course, when we celebrate the sacrament of the cross, the sign of the cross, as we do in this Eucharist. But whenever we pray, whenever and whatever we pray for, we're in Christ. This is an astonishing teaching. Every bringing of our desires before our Father in heaven is Christ in us, speaking to his Father, to his Father and ours. There are people you know, who just cannot believe that. They will tell you that the, the only true prayer is prayer for the higher spiritual things. Unselfish prayer. Prayer for the grace to be forgiving and kind. Prayer for a deeper understanding of the scripture. Prayer for the conversion of sinners. Prayer for others, not for ourselves. These people are very shocked if you say that praying to pass an exam or worse still, praying that you'll be able to afford a new car, is just as much a part of the life of the Spirit. You must indeed pray for the right things. But the right things are not the noble, high-minded things that you think you ought to want. They are the vulgar, rather infantile things that you really do want. Genuine prayer means honest prayer laying before your Father in heaven the actual desires of your heart. Never mind how childish they may sound. Your Father knows how to cope with that. People often complain of distractions during prayer. Their mind goes wandering off onto other things. This is nearly always due to praying for something you don't really much want. You just think it would be proper and respectable and religious to want it. So you pray high-mindedly for big but distant things, like, say, peace in Northern Ireland. Or you pray that your aunt will get better from the flu, but you don't really care much whether she does or not. Perhaps you ought to, but you don't. So your prayer is rapidly invaded by distractions arising from what you really do want. Promotion at work, let's say distractions are nearly always your real wants breaking in on your prayer for edifying but bogus wants. If you are distracted, trace your distraction back to the real desires it comes from and pray for them. When you're praying for what you really want, you won't be distracted. 
people on sinking ships do not complain of destruction during their prayer. Never mind then if your prayer seems selfish or childish. Your father can cope with that. If you will be honest in prayer, acknowledging that you're not very altruistic, that you do worry about your own interests, if you'll just try to be and admit to be as you are, the Holy Spirit, I promise you, will lead you into a deeper understanding of who you are and what you really want. Because prayer is not only a matter of asking, it turns out to be a matter of learning as well. It's about growing up, about discovering yourself. When you lay your desires, your true desires, before God, you begin to see them in a better perspective. Quite often you find they're not, after all, the things that you really want most of all. If you bring these desires out and into the light, not only the light of day but the divine light, the light of the Lord, you begin to see them as important but not the most important thing to you. And so through the practice of praying, God will often lead you nearer and nearer to realizing that in the end what you want most of all is God himself. But that's the end. And this is the only road there. There is no bypass. We all start as children and we need time to grow up. It's no good pretending we're already there. If you treat a five-year-old as an adult, she will never be allowed to grow into a real adult. If you treat yourself as a saint, you will never become one. You'll never even really want to become one. Growing up is not, of course, easy. We have to go through times of darkness and bafflement and regression. And this happens in praying, too. Bafflement. There's no such thing as an unanswered prayer, and God never gives us less than we ask. When he simply gives us just what we ask, he's treating us as children, and we can rejoice in that. But when he doesn't, he's always giving us a greater gift, inviting us to grow a little, to realize not just that there are greater and more important things, but that we actually want these more important things. The answer he's given us is just a little bigger than what we first asked for. And it can be very disturbing and painful to adjust to a new understanding of ourselves and our desires. This then is how the infinite, unconditional love of God takes us through our life stories. Not usually with thunderbolts and dramatic crises, but gently and gradually leading us into the light sometimes stumbling, sometimes uncomprehending, but all the time growing and finding ourselves, finding what it means to be in Christ, to be filled with the Spirit, to be the children of our Father in heaven. So this Advent, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his way and that we may walk in his paths. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord.